Next Sunday begins the Advent season, four-week time of preparation to celebrate the birth of our Lord. This Sunday in the church's calendar is noted as Christ the King Sunday, culminating the year and getting us ready then next week to start again with Advent and preparation. So the readings today both are rich in kingdom imagery. First is from 2 Samuel 23. I'll be reading verses 1 through 5. Uh, the slide says 1 through 7, but I will stop at the end of 5. Uh, these are marked as David's last words, David the great king of Israel. The inspired utterance of David, son of Jesse, the utterance of the man exalted by the Most High, the man anointed by the God of Jacob, the hero of Israel's songs. The Spirit of the Lord spoke through me. His word was on my tongue. The God of Israel spoke. The Rock of Israel said to me, when one rules over people in righteousness, when he rules in the fear of God, he is like the light of morning at sunrise on a cloudless morning like the brightness after rain that brings forth grass from the earth. If my house were not right with God, surely he would not have made with me an everlasting covenant, arranged and secured in every part. Surely he would not bring to fruition my salvation and grant me my every desire. Our New Testament reading comes... In John 18, it moves us toward the end of Jesus' time on earth. The passage will have him standing before Pontius Pilate, a Roman governor in Israel, uh, a man who had some significant political power but was otherwise a pretty destitute and empty man, and whose name pops up like in the Apostles' Creed because Jesus was brought before him in this way. Pilate then went back inside the palace, summoned Jesus, and asked him, are you the king of the Jews? Is that your own idea, Jesus asked, or did others talk to you about me? Am I a Jew? Pilate replied. Your own people and chief priests have handed you over to me. What is it you have done? Jesus said, My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders, but now my kingdom is from another place. You are a king then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Power holds a fascination for us, be it the uh, media power of Oprah Winfrey or the business power of Donald Trump or the political power of Vladimir Putin. When we're in the presence of people with power or aware of them, we generally take note because power fascinates us. In the weeks before my recent trip to Russia, when people found out I was going to Russia, the one comment I heard more than any other was something like this. Will you see President Putin? <laughs> and if you do, would you please ask him this? All right, I don't think I'll see him, but if I see him, I will be sure to uh, relay your question to him and see what he says. I never saw Putin in person in Moscow. I was looking, though, when I stood in Red Square. When I was at the Kremlin, I was certainly looking. I was ready to 
bring all your questions and those of my friends to him, but didn't see him. This guy Putin holds a fascination for us in the West. He is so powerful. He has a kind of political power that few other leaders on earth have. Our country, we have a president. We generally call our president the leader of the free world, but our president, every president of this country, while having power, has it pretty severely compromised in that the president has to deal with Congress, the courts, an opposition party, and the media. Now, in Great Britain, they do it a different way. They, they actually have a, a ruling monarch, currently Queen Elizabeth. Currently, I mean, she's been ruling as long as most of us have been alive, and it looks like she's the Energizer Bunny. She's going to keep going. Poor Charles is wondering, will I ever get a chance? <laughs> Mom, would you please move aside at some point? Oh, Queen Elizabeth, she has power, but it's pretty much only ceremonial power. She really has very little political power. Instead, they have a parliament that elects their prime minister, and the prime minister holds the political power. And of course, he can be voted out as soon as there's a parliamentary election, if the other party gets the majority of seats, the prime minister's gone, they come and they go, and Queen Elizabeth keeps on going. In Russia, there is President Putin. This guy's got power. In fact, he served eight consecutive years as president, and then, according to the Constitution, he had to step out of office. Oh, he did it very cleverly. He, he uh, anointed uh, Demedyev, to succeed him for one term, and then Demedyev made him his prime minister, his secretary of state, and Putin whispered in his ear during those four years, change the constitution, get rid of that four-year limit thing. So they did, and now Putin's back in power. And I, I asked a Russian friend, uh, kind of at ease, Tell me a little bit. I said, I'm not here for political reasons, but can you tell me a little bit about how Russians look at President Putin? She said, he's very powerful. She said, he will be president as long as he wants to. I said, but, but don't you, ha you have democratic elections now. She said, we are not a democracy. Putin will be president as long as he wants to. He has that power. I said, well, when, when his time is over, which I presume might be by death, I said, then what will happen? She said, oh, he will have named the, the next one. There's power there, and we're fascinated by power. Israel was fascinated by power for good reason. Ancient Israel never had much power. It was a small nation in a very tenuous place on earth, then as now, the Middle East. Israel was kind of at the crossroads of the Middle East, as it is now. The, uh, the marching armies of the big powers would just kind of march right through Israel, hardly paying much notice because Israel just wasn't much of a force. Small nation, humble leadership, and Israel fell under the spell of one power after another. Egypt, Syria, Persia, Rome. They decided they should have a king. They went to Samuel, this great leader, tremendous leader, and they said to him, Samuel, we need a king. And Samuel said, why do we need a king? Well, because all the nations around us have a king, so we should have a king, so we'll be like them. Samuel said, wait, we've got the Lord God Almighty who's chosen us as his special people. We have this unique relationship with the God of the universe. We don't need a king. They said, we want a king. Samuel went to God and God said, you're right, Samuel, but if they won't hear otherwise, then we'll give them a king. So God let them have a king. 
The first king was selected by casting central. Saul, tall, handsome, gifted, powerful. And he started well. And as often happens with people in power, then things stop going so well. I think he became intoxicated with his power and began making a series of poor decisions. And it all ended with him falling on his own sword. Samuel might have said, I warned you. And God brought forth another king, David. And what was, what was just totally surprising was David was not chosen by casting central. That, that, uh, that great Michelangelo statue notwithstanding, David was a, a shepherd boy who was kind of the runt of his family. He was the eighth son. And when Samuel went to Jesse to say, God has one of your sons to be king, Jesse said, sure, here's number one. He's the one. Samuel looked at him and said, nope. Number two, he's obviously the one. No, number three, no, no, no. Until he went through seven. And then Samuel said, isn't there another? Well, yeah, there, there's the shepherd boy. He's out in the fields with his flocks right now. Bring him. And young David was brought, and Samuel said, he's the one. No one would have picked him. And we know that David then became an amazing king. He, he unified the nation. He established Jerusalem as the capital of the nation. He, he had an amazing heart for God. In fact, he was called the man after God's own heart. He had a lot of power. And he got intoxicated with it. Though he was married, he saw a beautiful woman bathing and said, I want her. I'm the king. Bring her to me. You don't argue with a king. They did. And he had his way with her. And he found out that she was married, so he strategically planned that her husband would put in the front line in battle. And the plan worked. Uriah was killed. This wonderful David, this man after God's own heart, intoxicated with political power, made a mess of it. But, unlike Saul, David had a tender heart. And with contriteness, he repented. With tears, he went before God, begging forgiveness. Read Psalm 51. Begging forgiveness. And God is rich in forgiveness. And David was forgiven and restored. But if you read carefully, you'll see he did pay a price for his indiscretions. But he was restored. And he finished much better than Saul. And then the kingship just starts going downhill from there. One after another, down. We want kings at times, kings and queens, people in power. And when we get them, we're usually disappointed, aren't we? Lord Acton said it so well. Power tends to corrupt, and absolute power tends to corrupt absolutely. When people get in power, bad things usually come. They wanted a king. Now, God had a better plan all along, and that was a savior, a messiah, a different kind of king. 
And interestingly, that Messiah is linked to David because David, even with his sins, was a man after God's own heart with a, with a very tender heart. So the line of David becomes crucial in the unfolding of the Old Testament. There will, there will come one from the line of David, a son of David, and in due time, he came. Now, Israel was expecting a conquering king, be, precisely because of all those powerful nations that kept marching through and putting Israel under their boots. So, Israel wanted a powerful conquering king, one who's going to throw off the yoke of the Egyptians or the Syrians or the Persians or the Romans once and for all. It, it, we, we all kind of wa want a leader who's going to speak to what we perceive is our greatest need as a nation. God, give us that conquering king. And God gives them Jesus. Kind of disappointing. I mean, everything about Jesus from their expectations was kind of disappointing. He was not born like royalty, <laughs> born in the most humble circumstances. With all that talk in town about Mary's not married yet, is she? And she's having a baby. Does, is Joseph going to stand by her? And, and then they have to flee because of a, of a taxation thing and go to Bethlehem. And they get there and no room at the inn. And then they kind of hang around Bethlehem for a few years. And, and then Herod hears about this would-be king and unleashes his fury on the boy children of Bethlehem. And the angel of the Lord whispers to Joseph and Mary, and they become political refugees, fleeing to a country with a different religion and a different culture, hoping they'll be welcomed. We don't know quite how long little Jesus spent in Egypt, but we often forget that our Lord was a political refugee who had to flee across borders to another country, a country that had been Israel's enemy at times. And then he goes to Nazareth when the way is cleared and works in a carpenter's shop. And then at age 30 begins gathering his disciples and they don't look very royal. They're basically Galilean fishing people, a tax collector thrown in, which just makes it worse. God, this is not quite the king we were expecting. We wanted that conquering king. And you sent us a peasant, a servant. And, and now he stands before Pontius Pilate. Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus has this amazing ability to use questions to get the questioner thinking. Is that your own idea or did others tell you about me? Oh, hey, the word was out in the street. That's why he's standing before Pilate. Where'd you get that idea? Uh, Pilate, am I a Jew? And the answer is no. But your own people and chief priests handed you over to me. What have you done? And then Jesus says this, my kingdom is not of this world. Where is it from? And what's it like? To understand the Gospels, we must understand something of kingdom, kingdom of God. There are three essential elements to, to have a kingdom. A king, or a queen, or a ruling power, a realm, an area, and subjects. Jesus is the king. He doesn't hold any real estate. He never owned a home. The realm is wherever people 
welcome him. And the subjects? These Galilean peasants. Totally unimpressive. And he's parading as a king before Pilate, who works for the emperor in Rome, who knows how to do king. Big power. Bigger than Putin. And here's our king. It is such a humbling story we have. Uh, listen to these words. Uh, uh, Advent begins next week, but I, I just cheat a little bit and go into Luke 1. The angel appears to Mary, and, and, and the angel says, The Holy Spirit will come on you. The power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the one to be born will be called Son of God. Yay. Yay. And then Mary responds in that glorious song that we call the Magnificent. And she says this about God. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. We just don't think of humility with great leaders. And Jesus defines great leadership by humility, by becoming the servant of all, by putting down the perks of office and taking up a towel and washing the feet of others, by, put, by taking a child into, into his arms and putting the child in his lap and saying, the kingdom of God is like receiving this child by saying to his disciples when they ask about greatness, greatness is this, becoming the servant of all, even the slave of others. At crunch time before Pilate, he doesn't wilt one bit. He knows exactly what he's doing. This is our king. And he doesn't come in the way we were expecting. A week ago yesterday, I woke up to an early breakfast in Moscow. Shortly after that breakfast, we would be driven to the airport. Just before breakfast, we got the report that there had been terrorist attacks in Paris. Already, some had died and others were in critical care. That was the news we got before breakfast in Moscow. And then we were taken to the airport and we got on the Aeroflot jetliner. Aeroflot is the Russian national airline. Its logo still has the Soviet hammer and sickle on it. Got on that airplane and waited a little while. And I couldn't help but think, three weeks ago, a Russian airline flying over Egypt, there's Egypt again, flying over Egypt, is shot down out of the air, 242 people, all dead. And I'm sitting in an Aeroflot liner heading to the United States of America, hours after a terrorist attack in Paris, just weeks after that plane went down over the Sinai. Was I afraid? No, because my life belongs to Jesus, King Jesus. I have nothing to fear. I live in a dangerous world. When I'm in Moscow, I'm no more frightened than I would be in my neighborhood in Hamrietta. My life belongs to Jesus, and I live in a dangerous world. There is no safe place in this world. But my life belongs to King Jesus, and he knows what he's doing. I think of those words in Luther's hymn. We sang those four weeks ago, the last time I was here. Let goods and kindred go, this mortal life also. The body they may kill, God's truth abideth still. His kingdom is forever. I'm part of his kingdom. My life belongs to him. I'm part of his kingdom.
there is nothing to fear when King Jesus is my Lord. We are rather like ancient Israel, though. We in the church, we want a warrior king, and instead we get a servant king. We want to be in power, and Jesus calls us to serve others, often in weakness. We want God to destroy our enemies, and Jesus says, you must love your enemies. And I'm not sure that that is ever heard as clearly as after a terrorist attack that Jesus says, you must love your enemies. We wanted a king, and we got one. It just wasn't anything like what we were expecting. We got a servant king. We got a humble king. And our king is the greatest king of all. We see glimpses of the church catching on once in a while that just about take our breath away. Nine years ago, we saw it in a little Amish community in Pennsylvania when the Nickel Mines School experienced the death of five young Amish girls and the wounding of another five at the hands of a man who went in there with a gun. And in the days that followed, we saw that Amish community show a display of love and forgiveness that was startling. Taking casserole dishes to the home of the man who had killed their daughters and assuring them that God's forgiveness was abundant. That's the kingdom of God at work. Five months ago, we saw it again. We saw it at the Mother Emanuel Church in Charleston, South Carolina, where on a Wednesday night, as Bible study was just underway, and some of you may picture Tuesday nights here at Menden when we gather for Bible study. Maya Thompson was leading the Bible study that night, and before she left home, she said to her husband, I want you to look over my notes. She was just kind of in training to be a pastor there. And he looked and said, they look fine, Maya. She took them and and went off to teach Bible study. And into that Bible study burst a young man, a white, raised in the Christian church, raised by parents who are believers, burst in there, and shot to death nine of those dear saints, wounded another five. His notes indicated he did it so there would be another revolution in the South, another racial war that would put the the blacks back in their place. He killed nine of them and his plan failed because that church pulled together and chose to be the kingdom of God. And the relatives of the nine who died two days later were in a courtroom before a magistrate with that young man present and one after another looking him in the eye and saying, we forgive you. God's grace is sufficient. We forgive you. The majority of those bereaved people, the the, the large majority, have gone on record as saying, we don't want him to get the death penalty. We don't want to respond in kind to what he did to our loved ones. We forgive him. 
Felicia Sanders was in that Bible study and she survived, but her son Taiwanza did not. She asked the FBI for the return of two Bibles, her son's and hers. The FBI said, no, those were not recoverable. She insisted. The Bibles were sent to the FBI labs in Quantico, cleansed as thoroughly as possible page by page. And those two Bibles are now with Felicia Sanders. Their pages are pink with blood stains that will never wash away. But through those pink blood stains, she reads the Word of God. Jesus started a whole new kind of kingdom, not based on revenge, but based on abounding love, forgiveness, grace, and mercy. And why are any of us here today if it's not because of that boundless love, grace, and mercy? King Jesus calls us to a whole new way of living calls us to a kingdom, not of this world, but planted right in this world, where we live out a whole new way of forgiveness, grace, and mercy, because that is the way our King has lived among us, and His subjects can only do the same. All praise to King Jesus.